technology issue this morning. Good morning again. We are having a technology issue. Our broadcast is not working. So it looks like it's just us and we're gonna have to put a video up later, but the video will only be the lesson part of the service. Uh, we ask for each of you to bear with us this morning because we see many things in life that cannot save a man. Before we get started with the lesson, let's take a look at the song we sang earlier today. Open your Bibles, to, uh, your songbooks to number 392, please. Number 392. Number 392, first stanza, uh, fourth stanza, last line. Strive to keep sweet, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. I believe that there are some instructions there that we should follow. There are. It's difficult sometimes to be the person that God wants us to be. It's difficult every time to answer somebody with a sweet answer when we've all been in that position when what we want to say may not be so sweet. Has anybody else been there at least one time in your lifetime? Okay. Jesus Christ gives us, gives us some examples. Now, today's lesson is things that cannot save us. Well, there's some realities that we need to face first. So open your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. When the pages quit, I'll know everybody's on the right page. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. The first reality that we have to face is that you and I have a destiny. We have an expiration date, as I used to say, written on the bottom of your foot in invisible ink. And when you get to the end of whatever date is written on your foot, it's over. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 tells us just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment. If Jesus Christ does not come back, you and I are going to die. When that happens, we will face our judgment day. Now go to Acts chapter one, verse 11. Acts chapter one, verse 11. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go. The first reality that we have to face is that we're going to die. The second reality that we have to face is that Jesus Christ is coming back. When one of those two things happen, we will face our judgment day. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Second Peter, chapter three, verse six. By 
these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And verse 7, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So there's three realities we have to face. You're going to die. Jesus Christ is going to come back, and this world is coming to an end. At this judgment day, everybody, every man and every woman is going to wish that they could stand before God and have a clear conscience. Most people, nearly everyone, understands these three concepts. They understand these realities. However, many people are trying to find salvation in the wrong things. They're trying to find salvation the wrong way. And they're putting their faith and they're putting their hope and they're putting their trust in things that cannot save. The first thing people trust are false gods. If we look at the nations of old, Rome, Greece, they were polytheistic and they had the worship of many false gods. If you look at the Old Testament, there are at least 35 false gods mentioned in the pages of your Old Testament. There are many cultures today that are still here and functioning that believe in idols. What are idols? Idols are statues. And you know, people pray to statues. The Hindu religion, one of the largest religions in the world, has many false gods that are worshipped. Now, scripture tells us that false gods cannot save. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. And while you're turning there, I'm going to quote something else. <clears throat> Isaiah 41, 29 says, See, they are all false. Their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse four. Let's look at the New Testament. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse four. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know Paul says, pay attention, we know, it's not we think, we know an idol is nothing. Is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. Just one. The prophets of Baal, they learned this lesson the hard way when they were confronted by Elijah on Mount Carmel. They cried unto their gods all day long with absolutely no answer. Go to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. Now, for your reading at home, read everything from 20 to 40. But we're going to focus on verse 29. Midday passed, 
and they continued their frantic prophesying until time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. False gods cannot save because they are not real. First thing can't save us is false gods. Second thing that cannot save us is us. We cannot save ourselves. When a man or a woman sins, they have violated a law that is higher than a man-made law. We have violated a divine ordinance, an ordinance that originates with God. Now, in order for there to be atonement for sins, this will take a minute, Ezekiel 18.20, go there. This will take a minute. Chapter 18, verse 20, Ezekiel. Page 905, thank you. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. Those of you who have been here for a while have heard me tell you, God has no grandchildren. It doesn't matter how good your mom and dad were, it's you. You will stand judgment for that. But some of the requirements for the sacrifice is the victim must be equal to or greater than the one they are rescuing. The victim, the sacrifice, must be absolutely perfect, must be absolutely without blemish, and must be absolutely without sin. I don't qualify. And I doubt seriously if anybody here even thinks they do. Since you and I do not meet these qualifications, we can't pay the price to save ourselves. Jesus Christ had to do that. You and I, we are like a person who's floating in the middle of an ocean. We're like a person who got trapped in the quicksand. I don't see those in movie much anymore, but when I was a young man, getting trapped in the quicksand was a common Hollywood thing they did because there's no way out. When a person is sentenced to the death penalty and there's no hope of an excuse from the government, that's where you and I are. Ephesians chapter 2, go there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Paul says, you were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Jesus Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near out by the blood of Christ. The church at Ephesus, before they became Christians, had no promises in Christ. 
Before you and I became Christians, we had no promises in Christ. And only in Christ can we get near to God. False gods can't save you. Man, false gods can't save you. You can't save yourself. Man-made doctrines cannot save you. Just listen, we'll go to the next one. A long time ago, Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Lord, I know that the people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. You belong to God or you don't. That's not for me to decide. A man has no clue what God wants him to do separate from the word of God. And since God has revealed to us what we must do, we must do it. A man has no right to try and legislate in the place of God. If the government of the Philippines decided that murder was legal, does that make it okay with God? And the answer is no, it's not okay with God. Colossians chapter two, go there. Colossians chapter two, verse 20. Colossians chapter two and verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that were all destined to perish are based on merely human commands and teachings. What we need to be aware of is Colossians was written to a church that was located in a city called Colossae and false teachers had entered this church and they were teaching this church that they were subject to the rules of the Old Testament. And Paul classifies these commands as the doctrines of men. By the way, church, those of you who've been here for a while, that word doctrines, what is the Greek for that word? Let me hear you louder, please. Didascalia, what is the literal translation for didascalia into English? Teachings. Teachings, very good. Church, you know what you're doing. He classifies these commandments as the teachings, didascalia of men, the doctrines of men. And then he plainly states that these things are all going to perish. They're all going to go away. There are literally thousands of doctrines that men have created and many of them are contrary to God's will and none of them will save us and all of them will perish but God's will will endure forever first Peter chapter 1 verse 25 please first Peter chapter 1 verse 25 1 Peter 1 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So what cannot save? What cannot save is false gods. What cannot save is we can't save ourselves. What cannot save are the man-made doctrines. What cannot save 
Number four is Judaism, the Jewish religion. Now there are many people today that believe that the Jews are still the chosen people of God. And they believe that when Jesus returns, he's going to restore them to their rightful place in the world during something called a millennium and save them in the end. This, however, is not the case. No man can be saved by Judaism. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, because the old covenant had no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, please. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices. And this is the point which can never take away sins. The entire point is the sacrifices of Judaism cannot take away sins. The Jews as a whole do not believe that Jesus Christ is or was the Messiah. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is no salvation in Judaism. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is the subject of death? Judaism cannot save. False religions cannot save. Man-made doctrines cannot save. And we cannot save ourselves. And by the way, neither can human traditions. Human traditions demand extreme loyalty. My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, they believe X or Y, that my, my parents, my family have been whatever for however many generations, and that's human traditions. First Peter chapter one, verse 18. First Peter chapter one, verse 18. For you know, as soon as the pages quit, everybody's there. First Peter chapter one, verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying, just because mama did it this right, this way does not make it right. Just because grandmama did it this way does not mean it's correct. Just because my great granddaddy did it this way does not mean it's correct. He referred to them as the empty way of life 
handed down to you by your ancestors. You got to have some Greek today. The lesson here, vain, is a Greek word, matios. Strong's number 3152, and it means empty, profitless, without profit. Thayer says, absent or devoid of force, absent or devoid of truth, absent or devoid of success, absent or devoid of results. The ways that were handed down, matios, they mean nothing. These individuals, you and I maybe, were living an empty life because they were following traditions handed down to them. The only tradition that is profitable and is not vain is the tradition that is given to us by the apostles and the prophets of Jesus Christ. And if your parents and grandparents and great grandparents were followers of Jesus Christ, I hope that it's been a blessing to you because many of us, that's not the case. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 15. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 15. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 15. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, everything else that did not come from the apostles is Matthew's, empty, devoid. But the words that come to us from the apostles are, we're supposed to stand firm and hold fast because that's the way of eternal life. All, everything else means nothing. Okay, one more, I'm a good guy. I'm a good person. By the way, that seems to be a popular statement right now. I'm good people, but good being good, having goodness of your own is not enough to save you. There are a lot of people who function under the assumption that they will be saved just because they're good. There's three problems with that. And the first one is, Good is relative. It's a comparative term. You can only be good when you're compared to other people, not to the perfection of Jesus Christ. Second one, almost everybody thinks they're good. Almost everybody thinks they're a good person. Even some of the most evil people that have ever existed were considered good by some people. Now, there is only one who is good, and that one is Jesus Christ. Goodness does not put us in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. For notes to take home, read Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. But we're going to go to Acts chapter 10 right now and read the first couple of verses. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. At Caesarea... There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. 
He gave generously to those in need and he prayed to God regularly. Hold on, if we're gonna measure good, he and all of his family are devout. That's good. They are God-fearing. That's good. They're generous. They give generously to those in need. That's good. And they prayed to God regularly. That's good. So if good is a relative term, Cornelius qualifies. Well, you're in Acts chapter 10. Go a little bit to the right. Acts chapter 11, verse 14. Acts chapter 11, verse 14. He will bring you a message through which you and all of your household will be saved. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. He was already good. but he still has to be saved. Being good didn't get us there. There's one more, I hope. Many people will say, when I die, I hope I will be saved. <clears throat> what they mean is, they have a desire to be saved, but desire alone is not going to save you. If it was enough, then nearly everyone would be saved. I mean, come on, let's get real. Is there anybody sitting here or listening to us online who's going, hmm, I'm hoping I go to hell? <laughs> no, right? So everybody pretty much qualifies for that desire. However, the Bible does not teach that multitudes are going to be saved. In fact, it teaches something quite different. Go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and everybody finds it. No, that's not what it says, is it? It says only a few shall find it. Now, there's a parallel verse. Go to Luke chapter 13, and let's read what it says there. Luke chapter 13, verse 23. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Wait for the pages. Somebody told me. Wait for the pages. Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them in verse 24, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. The majority of the world falls into the categories we've spoken about. They think that their idols will save them. Or maybe they believe they can save themselves. Or maybe they think their man-made doctrines will save them. Or maybe they think Judaism is going to save them. Or maybe they believe their human traditions can save them. Or maybe they believe their goodness will earn them a place in heaven. 
Or maybe they believe that hope, just hope, will be enough. Salvation can only come through Jesus Christ. John 14 and 6 tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes into the Father except through me. Church, let's do that one together. I, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes through the Father except through me. All the rest of that stuff doesn't work. John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, God has really revealed a plan for us in the New Testament. And that plan is you should hear someone tell you about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Number one. Number two. You got to believe it. You got to take it in your heart and listen to the message and decide that it's for real. Number three, you have to repent of the sins that are in your life. But preacher, I don't have any sins in my life. I am a good guy. Yeah, first John chapter three tells us if you say you are without sin, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Then you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Number four, 1 Peter 3.21 tells us, for it is baptism now that now saves us. Not the washing away of physical filth, but the approach of a clear conscience towards God. Number five, you have to remain faithful for the rest of your life. It is not a once baptized, always saved kind of deal. You have to remain faithful. Revelations tells us, Remain faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. If you're a member of this church or not, and you are in need of special prayers for job, for family issues, for anything we can help you with, come on down, have a seat. If you are a Christian and you've fallen back in love with the ways of the world, by the way, they do look tempting to some people, to most people, most of the time. If you've fallen back in love with the ways of the world and you need public repentance, by the way, I will remind you that your repentance need be no more public than your sins. If it's between you and God, leave it between you and God. Number three, if you have never put on Jesus Christ through the act of baptism for the remission of your sins, then please come while together we stand and sing that invitation song. Let's all stand and sing hymn number 23. Number 23. All things are ready. Let's sing the first, the second, and fourth steps. First, second, and fourth. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Let's sing. All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now we spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear thy invitation, come who
All things are ready. Come to the feast. Live and hear and word is right. Come feast upon the love of God and drink everlasting life. Hear the invitation. Come who so ever will praise God for full salvation for who so ever will church I have to share some bad news with you. It's uh, somebody you don't know, but there's a gentleman by the name of Tinker Rich who died yesterday. Uh, he was a very dear, close brother to Sister Cora and myself back in Texas. And to his family, our prayers will go out. Um, we also want to tell you that I have a cousin by the name of Kathy Mansell. Uh, she got good news in that she is having treatment for cancer and uh, the size of the cyst has decreased through chemotherapy. By the way, Pedro, how's uh, your wife doing? She's doing great. Uh, it's stable now. I'm taking radiation and chemotherapy. Okay. And we're glad to know that Sister Glendy is gradually being restored to her state of well being also. Uh, Join us in prayer as we approach God. Lord, we come before you this morning, thanking you for the opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given us, the many things we forget to say thank you for. But Lord, we say thank you for the healings of Kathy and Glendy. We say thank you, Lord, for their restoration to physical well-being. And we pray for the family of Tinker Rich. May they get through this time of difficulty as their new separation from him. But they can be rest assured that when they get to heaven, he'll be there waiting on them. Lord, we ask these blessings and thank you for the many things that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.